Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Be seated. Friends, let us join together in an attitude of prayer, calling, praying along with the psalmist. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing unto you, for you are this community's rock and redeemer. Amen. Horatio Spafford was a well-known businessman in Chicago in the mid to late 1800s. He was well-known because he had set up, he had established a very successful legal practice and he was quite wealthy because he owned lots of real estate on the Michigan, Lake Michigan shoreline. He continued to be well-known, but he continued to be well-known for not great successes, but for the great hardships and tragedies in his life. Close together, Spafford lost his son, and not long after his son's death, he also lost much of his, much of his wealth, much of his property, thanks to the great fire of Chicago in 1871. A couple of years after that, Spafford decided that he and his wife and their four daughters needed to get away. They needed a respite after all the trauma they had experienced in the previous few years. So Spafford planned a trip for his family to go, to go over the Atlantic and to get to England for a little while. When the time come, came for the, for the family to board the ship, the Ville du, Ville de Har, du Harve, we're gonna pretend I pronounced all of that correctly. When it came time for the family to board this ship, Spafford had an unexpected business thing he had to deal with. So he sent his wife and his four daughters on ahead of him and said, I'll join you on another ship in just a few days. You'll only be a few days ahead of me. So his wife and four daughters traveled on. In the middle of their journey across the ocean, their ship collided with a much larger ocean liner. So the ship that Spafford's wife and his four daughters were on sank in 12 minutes. There were some survivors and many perished. Spafford's wife was one of the survivors. So when she was, when rescuers landed her safely in Wales, she sent a wired message to her husband, two simple words, saved alone. Spafford got on one of those next ships to make the journey to join his wife in England. Over the ocean, it said that the captain of his ship came to him at a certain point of the journey to let him know that at that place over the ocean, is where the collision between the two ships that took his four daughters occurred. It's believed that at that place, Spafford sat down and began to write lyrics. And he wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. The tune, is, the tune for this hymn is Ville du Harve, named after the vessel that Spafford's family was on. Like many of you, 
that hymn is written upon my heart. I grew up singing It Is Well With My Soul and have always loved it. But it wasn't until a few years ago that I learned the backstory. I always thought that was a beautiful story or a beautiful hymn, but when I learned the backstory, my feelings toward it changed. I loved it even more because no longer was it a hymn of a simple faith or a, a naive faith that is well with my soul. Rather, it's a hymn of faith that was forged on the anvil of suffering. Someone who knows what it's like not to be well writes, it is well with my soul. Knowing that backstory changed my understanding and change the way that I sing that hymn today. Throughout the month of September, we have been looking at the hymns of Israel. We've been looking at the Psalms. We've learned that several of them have a backstory and it comes through in the words, in the verses. The hymn, the hymn or the Psalm 150 that we read today, to say that it's a cheerful hymn or a cheerful psalm is an understatement. It's a loud psalm. It's a boisterous psalm. I would say it's obnoxious, but that has negative connotations. But it is loud and with every verse, it gets louder and louder. It moves from praising God with your lips and praising God here and there, praise God with your voice, praise God with trumpet. And then with every verse, another instrument is added in and it gets louder and louder as it goes from trumpet to the lutes and the harps and then to the stringed instruments and then to the, the cymbals and then the loud crashing cymbals. And then at the very end, after it's reached about what did they say on spinal tap? It's reaching 11. <laughs> then it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. At first, it sounds like the lyrics of a naive or simple faith. Just praise God. It sounds like the lyrics of a simple or naive faith because there's no reason given as to why you should praise God. The other questions are answered, what, how, when, where, who? But there's no answer to why. The psalmist does say, praise God for God's mighty deeds, but doesn't list any of God's mighty deeds. Now, that's unusual because the other psalms that are praise psalms, they do list God's mighty deeds. Other praise psalms say that we praise God because God was the one who delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. Other psalms praise God as David does, praising God for the forgiveness that follows confession. Other psalms give praise to God for the beauty of creation, for God's work in the world. And they praise God for defeating the enemies. Psalm 150 doesn't it doesn't say why it just says praise God hallelujah the Hebrew word meaning praise the Lord it's interesting that the last psalm would change that detail that the last psalm wouldn't provide any backstory within its lyrics why would they do this? Why would the writer, why would the organizers of the Psalms do that? Well, it could be that those who ordered the Psalms felt like if you've made it to Psalm 150, then the preceding 149 Psalms have done a good enough job of giving you all the reasons why you should praise God. So by the time you make it to Psalm 150 and that boisterous command comes, Praise God, the unspoken reason is, you know why. <laughs> Praise God, you've already read enough. Praise God, by this point, you get it. It also could be that the reason to praise God is left out 
purposely in another way. It could be that the writer of Psalm 150 is teaching us that praise of God exists above and beyond anything, above and beyond even reason. So the psalmist writes in 150, praise God in God's sanctuary in the heavens. Praise God with all of these instruments, everything that has breath, praise the Lord, no matter what or why. Praise God. I love these held together. I love these two reasons held together because they speak the truth or they speak to the truth of our life of faith in my life of faith in our life of faith. They speak this truth. Praise God and you know why. And praise God no matter what, no matter why. This speaks truth to faith because the truth of faith The truth of praise, that there are times that praise comes so naturally. I heard it from one of y'all this morning. I said, how are you doing? And you said, well, I am doing wonderful. You know, praise God, I woke up today. I am bright-eyed and bushy-tailed was your direct quote. So there are times that praise just wells up so naturally. Praise God, I am upright and taking nutrients. That's how Pastor Brent puts it. Praise God, I am healthy today. Praise God, my family is doing well. Praise God, the line at Starbucks today was not too long. Praise God. Praise God, I just had a delicious meal. Praise God, I enjoyed worship today. Praise God, I'm looking forward to having some wild game tonight. Praise God, hallelujah. There are times that praise just wells up so naturally within us and we get louder and louder as we offer our hallelujahs. There are times that praise even comes naturally when we reflect, when we look back and remember all that God has carried us through. There are times where we can look back to the past, past times where we were in the pit, when we were in the dark, when we didn't like who we are, what we were doing, where we were, how things were going. And when we compare those times to these times, we say, hallelujah. I am glad I am here, oh God. Thanks be to God. Who I am today is not who I was. Where I am today is not where I was. Hallelujah, God. Thank you so much for carrying me from there to here. There are times when praise wells up so naturally that we say, Hallelujah, I know why. And the other truth is that there are times in life where praise does not come naturally. There are times in life where that word hallelujah feels awkward to say. There are times when praising God feels out of place. It's hard, it's hard to say hallelujah, hallelujah with tears in our eyes. It doesn't come naturally to say hallelujah at the graveside of someone who died too soon. It doesn't feel right to say hallelujah, praise God, at the bedside of our loved ones suffering with cancer. It doesn't feel right to say hallelujah as we care for our spouse who has dementia. Hallelujah taste funny in our mouth when there are tears of sorrow in our eyes. 
But Psalm 51 says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. This psalm is teaching us a profound lesson about praise. Psalm 51 teaches us that we do not defer praise until we are satisfied. We do not defer our praise to God until we get what we want from God. Our praise is more than about getting something from God. But don't be confused. We do receive something when we offer our praise to God for our praise does more for us than it does for God. When we praise God, we are opening ourselves up to hope. In our praise, we are doing one of the most hopeful things we can do. When we praise God, we are asking or we are opening ourselves up to see the world the way that God sees the world. When we praise God, even when it doesn't feel right, we are opening ourselves up to see and to remember and to see where God has been and could be at work. When we praise God, even when it doesn't feel natural, we're asking ourselves to remember. We're asking ourselves to remember. And there's a, a quote that I've shared with you before from Brene Brown and this power of remembering God's mighty acts in the past. She puts it like this, grace is the whisper when you are in the dark that says to you, I can't make this any less frightening. But I can remind you, you've walked through this before. <clears throat> Praising God in the dark and in the pit can help us to remember all of the times that with, with God's help, by God's help, we have walked through it before. And so when we praise God, because it's what we do, even when it doesn't feel natural, even when it feels awkward, even with tears in our eyes, we are opening ourselves up to the confidence that God will continue to work just as God has worked throughout history. And then in doing so, we believe that we will be led back to praise for it, it always comes back to praise. Hallelujah. Amen.